Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, let us discuss about antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. This is one condition where the patient can have arterial and venous thrombosis. It can be diagnosed when there is recurrent arterial venous thrombosis, recurrent fetal loss, thrombocytopenia in presence of antiphospholipid antibodies and patient who is having SLE, who is having arterial or venous occlusions. All these conditions we can suspect antibody, uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. SLE can itself is a risk factor for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and that is one of the most common conditions where patient present with uh, uh, arterial or venous thrombosis. Isolated antiphospholipid syndrome also seen without any uh, clinical manifestation of SLE or any other rheumatological disease. Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome can present without primary diseases. Now we can see the major features of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. The most important problem is hypercoagulability. It's an hypercoagulable state. There are various hypercoagulable states. This is one of the conditions where there is recurrent arterial or venous thrombosis. Many patients can have thrombocytopenia also. This thrombocytopenia can be due to a consumption of platelets for the thrombus or due to immune mediated destruction of thrombus. There are various mechanisms for this thrombocytopenia. But many patients are having thrombocytopenia. And many patients have pregnancy related complication like patient can uh, lose pregnancies, uh, abortions are common, congenital heart syndromes are common like uh, congenital heart blocks are common. Most of these patients who is having antiphospholipid antibody syndrome may require lifelong anticoagulation whether it is by heparin, then warfarin or other uh, drugs which, uh, which can be given as oral anticoagulation agents. There is a condition called as catastrophic APS. Catastrophic APS means patient develops severe widespread thrombosis, sudden onset and patient mostly may die during the acute attack itself because most of the time this may not be diagnosed in peripheral centers, so patient deteriorate very fast. We can see the clinical criteria, vascular thrombosis, one or more clinical episodes of arterial, venous or small vessel thrombosis occurring within any tissue or organ, complications of pregnancy, one or more unexplained deaths of morphologically normal fetus at or after 10th week of pregnancy one or more premature births of morphologically normal uh, fetus at or before 34th week of gestation, three or more unexplained consecutive spontaneous abortion before the 10th week of gestation. So these are the common uh, pregnancy related problems in APS. If we see the mechanism of uh, pregnancy related complications, it is due to antibodies to phospholipid binding proteins that produces inhibition of trophoblastic function and differentiation, activation of complement pathways and maternal fetal interface resulting in local inflammatory response, thrombosis of the uteroplacental vasculature in the later pregnancy. So the main problem in pregnancy is obstruction of the uteroplacental blood vessels that leads to the death of the fetus. So like thrombosis occurring everywhere in the body, whether it is arterial thrombosis, venous thrombosis, microcirculation thrombosis, here also patient develops thrombosis in the placental arteries. Thromboembolism, it can be venous thromboembolism or arterial thrombolism, embolism. This is one of the uh, one of the important condition which can present with bo both arterial and venous thromboembolism. There are very few conditions which can present with 
both arterial and venous thromboembolism because the mechanism of arterial and venous thromboembolism are different so uh, there are very few conditions which can produce arterio venous thromboembolism it accounts for 65 to 70 percent of thrombotic events in a patient most frequent site of venous thrombosis is lower limbs calf muscle tenderness swelling of the calf muscle lower limb edema sudden onset of pain in the lower limbs all these things are very common arterial thrombosis can occur as a uh, like a clinical manifestation like it can present with stroke myocardial infarction retinal obstruction subclavian digital brachial artery obstruction non healing also is also very common in this type of patients now thrombosis is a major problem for antiphospholipid antibodies so endothelial cell damage can occur monocyte uh, regulation of tissue factor production platelets also can produce the thrombotic events uh, anti beta 2 uh, gpi antibody complex can also produce uh, thrombosis these all pro thrombotic states and that leads to uh, complement activation other procoagulant conditions like inflammation estrogens pregnancy uh, trauma all these things then that leads to thrombosis whatever it is thrombosis is a major problem in uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome catastrophic uh, aps we have already seen that it's a sudden onset of uh, apls syndrome acute retinal uh, acute renal failure respiratory distress syndrome diffuse alveolar hemorrhage encephalopathy adrenal hemorrhage all these things are the features of uh, catastrophic A aps diagnostic criteria is evidence of involvement of three or more organ system it is something like a multi organ dysfunction syndrome development of manifestation simultaneously or in less than one week confirmation by histopathological small vessel occlusion in at least one or more organs laboratory confirma confirmation of the presence of anti phospholipid antibodies in that third uh, point cannot be done routinely in clinical practice uh, if, only if there is a, a skin involvement we can do uh, biopsy histopathology from there otherwise it will be difficult to take biopsy from internal organs in uh, uh, catastrophic aps we have to uh, depend on the lab investigation like anti phospholipid antibody syndrome and multi organ dysfunction and anti phospholipid antibody positivity and multi organ dysfunction syndrome if we see the diagnostic criteria for by lab anti cardiolipin antibodies are positive anti cardiolipin igg igm antibodies present at moderate to high levels lupus anticoagulant antibodies lupus anticoagulant antibodies detected in blood one or two occasions at least 6 weeks apart many drugs like phenothiazines hydralazines procainamide phenytoin can produce apls syndrome but here uh, production of antibodies to uh, anti beta 2 glycoprotein uh, antibodies i antibodies may be uh, can be uh, negative in that conditions because the the drug induced uh, apls syndrome it will not be formed no anti phospholipid antibody syndrome clinical diagnosis we have already seen thrombotic events arterial thromboembolism venous thromboembolism small vessel thrombosis stroke myocardial infarction retinal damage peripheral uh, ulcers non healing ulcers all these things are the clinical features laboratory criteria anti cardiolipin antibodies anti beta 2 glycoprotein uh, antibodies lupus anticoagulant uh, antibody positivity will give you the diagnosis now once you uh, diagnose ptinr is elevated most of these conditions uh, ptinr will be elevated we have to go for a mixing study so mixing study will tell you whether it is a uh, deficiency of an inhibitor protein or a coagulation factor deficiency coagulation coagulation factor deficiency diseases are entirely different this is an inhibitor uh, against uh, uh, it's an inhibitor of coagulation factors that is uh, lupus anticoagulant so that can be 
done in these conditions. Uh, mixing studies help to distinguish clotting time prolongation due to coagulation factor deficiency or an inhibitor. So, that can be done in this uh, type of patients initially itself to diagnose uh, uh, APLS syndrome. Now, when we have a patient who is having a recurrent thrombosis or even first time thrombosis, if there is no risk factor like a patient is not having any malignancy, patient is not having prolonged bed rest or patient is not taking oral contraceptive pills. So, nothing is there we have to think about primary hypercoagulable states. In that we have to do some uh, investigations, this is the investigation panel for that PT, APTT can be done and mixing study also should be done for these patients if PTINR is elevated. Then other investigations like anti-cardiolipin, anti-phospholipid antibodies, beta 2 glycoprotein 1 antibody assay all these things should be done that will give you the diagnosis of anti-phospholipid antibody syndrome. Other things are protein C, protein S deficiency, antithrombin 3 deficiency, other factor deficiencies, fibrinogen deficiencies all these things you can do. Uh, to diagnose other conditions. Factor 5 laden uh, mutation can be diagnosed. So, so many other causes also that that has to be done uh, if you are suspecting any hypercoagulable state. But if uh, antiphospholipid antibodies are positive then we can make a possible diagnosis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. All patients who is having antiphospholipid antibody syndrome it is better to uh, go for diagnosis of uh, SLE. Because SLE is one of the important rheumatological condition associated with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Many malignancies also can have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Acquired condition like severe infection sepsis also can present with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Then some patients who is having recurrent pregnancy loss we can investigate for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Some patients with have fetal cardiac abnormalities like um, congenital heart blocks we can investigate for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So, all these things are very important when we are suspecting this type of syndromes. Now, once you diagnose antiphospholipid antibody syndrome whether the patient is in pregnancy or before diagnosis of pregnancy we have to start heparin. Heparin can be given as 80 milligram IV uh, per, uh, 80 units per kg then 18 units per kg as an infusion or we can give 5000 uh, international units DID. Both ways you can give heparin. So, heparin uh, in acute conditions both in pregnancy and normal person you can give. Low molecular weight heparin is e equally beneficial that does not require monitoring of uh, APTT but heparin if you are giving monitoring is very important. Heparin we need to admit the patient in the hospital. Low molecular weight heparin you can give it as OPD basis also. So, both are uh, clinically equally beneficial, but advantage advantages are there for low molecular weight apparent. Cost wise low molecular weight apparent is uh, costlier than uh, regular apparent. Now, along with apparent in APLS syndrome most of these patients require lifelong anticoagulation. If the patient is not pregnant you can start warfarin. The patient is pregnant then better to avoid warfarin you have to continue with heparin or low molecular weight heparin doses. Low molecular weight heparin should not be continued in patients who is having renal failure. In that type of patients conventional regular heparin is better than long acting low, low molecular weight heparin. So, warfarin can be started along with heparin because warfarin takes minimum 7 days to get its peak action. So, if you are giving 10, unit, 10 milligram of warfarin along with heparin 5000 units DID by 7th or 8th day warfarin action will get its peak. So, till then you have to monitor APTT. After warfarin you have to monitor the PT and INR. PT INR will be elevated slowly. Some patients we may have to add aspirin also especially patients who are pregnant ladies we have to add uh, aspirin also. Other drugs they, they are direct oral anticoagulants or non-vitamin K dependent uh, oral anticoagulant like dabigatran, 
apixaban, endoxaban, rivaroxaban all are equivalent to warfarin they are costly but they require no uh, regular monitoring of uh, PTINR. We can start the drug like low molecular weight apparent we no need to monitor APTT. Here this type of drugs we no need to monitor the PTINR on regular basis. Heparin has to be overlapped with warfarin because suddenly if you, uh, st uh, you continue heparin for 7 days and stop heparin then start warfarin. Warfarin will take another 5-7 days to act so in between there will not be any drug to cover the thrombo hypercoagulable stage. So, it is always better to start warfarin along with uh, heparin then continue warfarin for 5-7 to seven days, stop heparin then continue warfarin. You can titrate the, down the dose mostly because uh, some doctors start with a lower dose and go hike up the dose, but uh, the correct method is start with higher dose and hike down the dose like start with 10, uh, 10 mg of uh, warfarin then reduce to 7 mg, 5 mg, 4 mg like that you can reduce. Direct oral anticoagulant drugs are apixaban. 10 mg BD for 7 days followed by 5 mg BD. Dabigatran is 150 mg BD can be given. If patient develops a bleeding tendency, reversal of Dabigatran can be done by Idarizumab IV 5 gram. Revaroxiban is factor 10A inhibitor, direct oral anticoagulant. Dose is 15 mg BD for, uh, with food 21 days followed by 20 mg OD with food to be continued. Reversal agent is uh, available Adnexa Alpha. So, these drugs uh, does not require any monitoring of the uh, PTNR whereas warfarin we need to monitor. Another drug which is resembling warfarin is Acetrome, Acinocomoral that also uh, require monitoring of PTNR. The only major disadvantage of warfarin is it has got lot of drug interaction with um, uh, various other uh, oral drugs. So, it is always better to do the PTNR after starting any drug for this type of patients. And in emergency room, we have to be very careful if the patient is on uh, drugs like warfarin, phenytoin, digoxin, whenever we start any drug in these patients, we have to check the interaction. Some drugs can increase the drug level of um, these type of drugs. Some dr drugs can reduce the level of these drugs. So, in some combination, warfarin, digoxin or phenytoin can reduce the level of the newly started drug. So, there are a lot of drug interaction we have to be very careful. Warfarin has got interaction with many food items and uh, drugs. Now, unprovoked thrombotic event in APLA syndrome require lifelong oral anticoagulation along with that we have to give aspirin or clopidogrel that also should be given because it is a primarily arterial thrombosis and patient can have venous thrombosis also even if the patient present with venous thrombosis if it is APLA syndrome later they can come with arterial thrombosis so it is better to start aspirin to prevent arterial thrombosis. Hydroxychloroquine also can be started in some patients depending on the severity. Statin has to be given in all patients who is having uh, arterial thrombosis irrespective of the causes. Now, all patients who is having uh, pregnancy related APLA syndrome also aspirin is a must along with low molecular weight apparent. In a, in a patient who is having resistant APS or catastrophic APS, if you diagnose uh, the uh, problem initially itself, we can give intravenous IVIG. IVIG or plasma exchange, plasma pheresis plus heparin plus warfarin. So, plasma exchange and IVIG will remove the antibodies which is already preformed. Uh, uh, antibodies are already there in the blood that can be removed by plasma exchange, it can be neutralized by IVIG. Then along with regular heparin, warfarin, aspirin all these things. Another important drug which can be given in acute attacks that is rituximab. 
like rituximab is used in rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, various other immunological disorders, here also it can be used. It is a monoclonal antibody against CD20 beta cells, B cells. Eculizumab is another drug which, which is a complement component C5 antibody that also can be given in this type of patients. If you see the heparin initial dose is uh, 80 units per kg as initial bolus then 18 units per kg per hour infusion. Activated thromboplastin time that is APTT in 6 hours should be checked. And here this chart will give you uh, an idea about how to titrate the uh, heparin dose depending on the uh, APTT levels. This chart will, lead, will tell you how to monitor and uh, continue the uh, vitamin K antagonist that is warfarin. If the patient develops bleeding on warfarin, then you have to give vitamin K 10 mg IV and fresh frozen plasma or factor 7 concentrate. We have discussed about one important condition that is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. When we are working in emergency room, we know that uh, patients can come with uh, various type of uh, uh, infarctions. It can be DVT, it can be pulmonary embolism, it can be myocardial infarction, it can be stroke, it can be any type of arterial or venous thrombosis. In clinical practice, venous thrombosis is most important. But in APLA syndrome, sometimes myocardial infarction can present as a part of APLA syndrome. Patient can present with stroke. So if you do not know about the basic disease, uh, you will be taking the patient only for a specific procedure like uh, somebody is having myocardial infarction will be only doing uh, standing and other type of procedures. You may miss the problem here. So whenever we are getting unusual thrombosis, especially in female patients who are very young, pregnancy loss history, all these things we have to always suspect antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So even if we are not suspecting a young lady coming with uh, DVT or any thrombotic events or pregnancy loss, it is always better to do the investigation like APLA antibodies. APLA antibodies can be positive uh, as a part of uh, uh, APLA syndrome. That may be primary APLA syndrome or secondary due to rheumatological diseases like SLE or sometimes it can be a part of uh, sepsis or it can be sometimes a part of malignancies. So, so many uh, other diseases also can be behind this problem. So, it is better to investigate these patients properly and find out what is the reason for APLA syndrome. Like APLA syndrome secondary to sepsis, no need to continue uh, lifelong uh, uh, warfarin. In that case, we can stop the drug after six, uh, six or seven months. But whereas a part of SLE induced APLA syndrome or a primary APLA syndrome, they require lifelong warfarin. And patients who are who are having uh, APLA syndrome who become pregnant, then heparin is the choice of the treatment, especially low molecular weight heparin. Their warfarin cannot be continued in pregnancy, so low molecular weight aparin and aspirin will be a choice in that condition otherwise patient can develop recurrent pregnancy losses. Thank you.